So I will kick things off for this, right? We'll do screen shares. Um, let me get some windows in shape and close some things here real quick. I don't know why my VPN has like six copies open. That doesn't seem healthy. Uh, mono repo. Um, the nice thing is I just accepted without testing and Nikki, what, like 5,000 lines of changes that you just pushed in the last few days? And I accepted it five minutes before here, and I have 100% confidence that everything works. Everything, oh, right? everything works. You I'm know like, I wasn't hey. sleeping all week, right? Yeah, I know. I know, but neither was this I. This is so. like living dangerously. <laughs> so um, let's go to uh, the repo then. So I did want to mention this one. I'm not going to focus on it too terribly much. Um, this was a big deal. Uh, for for me at least in the last few weeks is um, I ch in a, I changed the way that we do our build routine so um, and the way that we ship that up so we still do a build that's called an unbundled build and so the difference between um, like a, if you go to Open WC and you run through their tooling and their build routine which I highly recommend Open WC if you're just getting going um, or you know just working on things in vanilla um, but OpenWC will do um, a roll-up based build, which is similar to like a web pack if you've used that before. And then you get an output that is effectively, hey, here's everything compiled and drop this one line in and your stuff will work. Well, there's, um, there's significant performance gains that can be achieved by not building everything. Because when you do that, you're building against IE11. Um, so what we're really trying to do is build um, build that will serve in a differential way. So our unbundled web components repo, I can post a link after it, attempts to have one way of doing all the building for your project that's kind of engineered primarily for like a content management system audience. So if OpenWC's primary target audience is more of like application building and hey, you know the structure of your whole app and then you're done, what we're trying to do is say, okay, you already have properties in place. Um, let's say that those are Drupal, WordPress, maybe it's a static website that already exists but isn't built with traditional tooling. How can we build web components in a really generic way so that you can have a single line to add to your CMS or what have you, and then basically just get access to these other tags. So it's more of an enhancement, progressive enhancement centric routine as opposed to saying, hey, we built a whole application this way. Um, the big win with this, um, I showed it at Hacks Camp in October, and I, I specifically remember Cassandra's husband being like, that makes sense, but I'm not going to do it because it's so many lines, um, is that we got it down to a single line integration. So what you end up putting in your site looks something like this. Oh, is damn. You have you have, <laughs> you have script SRC equals build.js. And then build.js is an ultra generic um, uh, script that is a lot of that stuff that was in there before. Um, but oh, this the, is new to me. This is yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, this is how I was going to tell you to do your, your um, is it the African, what is, what is that site you just put the video player on? You should probably African show Brilliance. That. Yeah, you should at least, you should at least show that site. <sighs> Um, yeah, but so, so the idea is that you have an entry point for your application, but that this little uh, script here is going to figure out if it should serve you ES5, if it should serve you um, ES6, but compiled to work on um, some slightly older browsers, or if it should serve you what this claims is ES6, but is actually now ES8. Um, and the reason we do that is because ES8 code, if you're not familiar with that, it's uh, the JavaScript standard based on what would be, I think, 2019 uh, or 2017. I can't remember which way it goes. I think it's 2017. Um, but that all modern evergreen browsers support at least that. And so if I ship you um, ES8 code, it will statistically run faster with less code than if I were to ship you compiled code to run in, a, in, in an IE11 environment. Um, so the other nice thing with this script, and I'm not, you know, going to super detail, but it basically does some feature detection on the front end to figure out whether it can serve you this, um, this script at all, is that it only loads polyfills for you if you need them. Um, so it also has one for animation, 
So if you need animation polyfill, it'll load that. So I've found this to be 50 plus percent faster than the way we were doing things before, even though it's just the same script, but put in one file. Um, I think it's because there's, there used to be some document.write statements involved. Those are all gone. Um, but so we're using this now. Um, Becca, who won't talk about whatever it is she is or isn't doing, is using this now. Um, and I used this recently on a non, uh, a non hacks related project. She'd tell you, but she'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> there, it, there's the stuff that we'll get in trouble for. So no, no, it's more like uh, we're we're still in development with it. And we haven't pushed it live yet. So if we, it's not embargoed necessarily, but it's not something that we're publicly talking about a lot. There you go. So cool. people theoretically could potentially use this repo. Um, so there's that thing. Um, but I did want to show uh, if Chuck did, I will leave this other tab for Chuck to go over um, because it is all him, um, but we'll see if he's able to make it on by the end. If he's not able to make it on by the end, I'm gonna at least show it because it's, it's incredible the site that he's working mm -hmm. on. But so this is, um, I'm running um, a build a routine and I do wanna actually show what's going on here. Uh, so you can see how we work locally because Nikki's permissions are screwed up on her computer and she can't do this, unfortunately. But so the way that we work on hack CMS and the way that we test hacks and all of our other elements in a quasi application environment is um, we actually, we have a mono repo that's LRN web components. And so we do yarn install in here. I'm not gonna run it right now. And so we end up getting our mono repo and all of its dependencies here. But then when we work on hack CMS, I sim link over to the node modules directory of that LRN web components mono repo. And this allows us to more efficiently work on all the elements in hacks, but do it in this kind of more production, uh, a full application environment. A lot of times when we talk about our mono repo, we're talking about like, uh, you know, Nikki's going to show simple fields later and she goes in and works on an individual component or a series of components. This is our way of getting all those individual components into something that actually can stand up and, you know, represent a website. So um, then I go into sites and one of my sites in Hack CMS, which then has its node modules and uh, distribution directories symlinked down downstream. I love symlinks. I don't know why. But so now if I do yarn start um, from any hack CMS site, it is going to be able to, and it takes a while to stand up initially because it has to compile some stuff on the fly, but it's going to serve me my site that I normally would get if I had like a container up or, or I was running on a live web server, um, except it's going to give me it locally, but using those assets that are being built in real time. So this allows me to do local development, but against what looks like a production website. So I'm going to hit refresh. You see it's chugging because the initial like one or two paints because of the way that we do the, uh, the uh, serving these assets under the hood. And I'll actually, there we go. Yeah, see it says generator has de-optimized for styles. Um, so it's gonna take a little bit here. There we go. It's gonna, yeah, I'll say it's gonna do it like two or three times and then it'll be good. Okay, so I always, I always basically spin it up and then keep hitting refresh until it's fast because that means it has everything cached. Um, so then I'll go to a page and you will see a combination of uh, the NARA user experience audit that we implemented and something that I only got to experience five minutes before we started recording, uh, which Nikki has uh, cleaned up a lot of other U elements inside of Hack. So, I'm gonna to go to edit a page. And now this is what the authoring experience looks like in Hacks. Um, so if you saw Hacks even like a month ago, it didn't look anything like this. Um, and that's kind of the beauty of web components. We were able to take elements that had semantic intention, like, hey, this is the, the bar that wraps this. Um, oh, uh, Nikki, can you see if anyone has knocked late as a late arrival? under managed participants. I just got a notification from oh, someone. Oh yeah. Wes, just, yeah. Oh good. Okay, yeah, if you can let Wes put I'm in. trying. I'm trying, ah, oh, there we go. Cool. Okay, hold on, I'm gonna, sorry, just let, let give him a second to hop in. Um, all right, now I'll go back to the share. 
you can share who you are in just a moment, Westbrook. <laughs> Sorry, didn't see you there. So, um, so this is uh, the new version of Hacks. Um, there's just a bar that can be moved around. Um, some of the icons that got goofed up in the last like day, because as I said, Nikki was really hacking on this a lot yesterday. Um, so like I can hide the menu and then just have this editing and writing experience. Um, I can expand that back out, switch the alignment of this menu. Um, it also, it, it has some much better mobile support. So it'll like sticky to the interface. It's a little hard to show with the, the screen streaming though. Um, and then these options over here are variable based on what I'm editing. So if I go to like a list, you see it says that this is a bulleted list now. Um, and then it'll have certain options relative to whatever that is. So if I wanted to say search NASA, uh, we can still do stuff like that in context, but it's a lot uh, easier to use than it was previously. So if I wanna search for photos of the moon, I can now take that and drag and drop it out onto the UI and it'll show me zones where I'm gonna place that. So I can drop that moon there. Um, another thing that's dramatically different from what it was before, if I wanna put that in a grid, I used to do all these, these presentations about like, okay, and then I click this and then I click 40 other buttons and we're good. Now there's this little bar over here. I can just hit add column and now I've got two columns or I can hit that and now I've got three columns. Um, you'll also notice little touches like this bar is a lot more contextually aware. Um, so it's, you know, jumping around, it's angling to the edges of things as they move. Um, I can take this heading, duplicate it, take that, drag and drop it over there. And you see it says H2 aligns correctly with where it is. Um, so we've been doing a ton of work in, the, in just the little tiny key operations, quite honestly. Like if I highlight this, there's additional options that show up, right? Because I don't need to see bold and italic all the time. I just need to see it whenever I actually going to be able to implement that. Um, so still work to do. Uh, we, in my mind and, and Nikki, this is so that you also hear me say it because I say it quite a bit is anytime there's a modal, in my opinion, that means there was not a UI decision made. <laughs> so if this just defaults <laughs> to a modal or a fly out, it was, oh crap, I don't know how to handle this visually, but I need to keep working forward because I have this idea. Let's just stuff it in a modal. And so <laughs> um, you have uh, a, lot more, a lot more options over here as well. Um, so now I can take grids and I can either drag and drop a grid from there if I wanted to and manipulate it by adding columns or duplicate it. Um, you also have settings that show up contextually, which happened before. They're just a lot nicer looking. Um, so for example, if I were to put a, uh, like a stop note, I can either put a stop note there and Nikki and I identified an issue with drag and drop. And then under configuration, hey, what are you doing? hide from the COVID-19. And so I can tweak the icon of that. Um, oh, apparently Nikki, now we can just select every icon in the universe, that's cool. Um, if it's set up for multi-select, you can. Ooh, well then. Uh, tweak that icon, put it in there, duplicate it, right? So a lot of making sure that these things stay in place conditionally, all that stuff, we've done a ton of work figuring out. Um, also got the bit of a view source, which I'm going to say, Nikki, did you do something to this? The code editor? editor? Oh, yeah. I made the code editor prettier. Of course you did. Um, let's say, because it looks nicer and it loaded a heck of a lot faster. Um, yeah. There's also certain options um, that we added and removed as far as some, some admin interface stuff. Um, I don't think I'll be able to show it in here. Let me see if I inspect. Um, I spent an illogically large amount of time. Hey, look, there's a pop-up. I mean, it's not designed. Um, an illogically large amount of time to get um, the voice command system working. <laughs> and you might say, what is a voice command system? And I'm glad you asked hypothetical version of me. So the voice command system, which I think will actually work at Axiom. Yeah, it will. Um, so I'll go to, um, let's go to example playground, it's safer. So what I just jumped off to is um, we are 
running hacks in a um, software as a service configuration at Penn State now. Uh, I use it for teaching in, a, in my classroom. Um, so this, is the act, this version is actively out there in the wild versus what you were just seeing was running locally. Oh, wants to use your microphone. I don't think I have the debug on, so it's kind of difficult to use um, because the debug prints a ton of, of statements. Let me see if I refresh it, if it'll still do it. Uh, it doesn't have the debug in there. Um, hey, Hacks. Oh, that's not its name. Hey, Worker. Yeah, what do you want? Insert content. Oh, that's not what it's called. It's insert image. Hey, there we go. Um, so you have to actually see the commands is still working on it, obviously. Um, but you, it also does some lightweight voice to text stuff. Hey worker type, this is what I've always wanted to do is just talk and have someone else transcribe it for me. Oh, it failed. Oh, well. So anyway, that's an experiment. There's an element for that because there always is since we're coming from Drupal land where people always said there's a module for that. So the element is called HAL-9000. HAL um, it wraps the Anyang library, um, which is, uh, is something that works in anything. And the last thing that I wanted to <clears throat> talk about in any way, or maybe hopefully more so generate discussion off of is um, we don't have any good solution currently for internationalization. And it's, it's not um, just because of complete oversight. It's mostly because I haven't liked any of the solutions I've seen thus far. Um, and it's because of this problem. So um, when I see people integrate um, translations and internationalization, they're usually doing it from like the, hey, I have a whole application, cool, now let's translate the whole application into fill in the blank. Um, and the work that, that our team is, is doing is a lot more of, if we produce hundreds of reusable bricks that work in any context, then we can assemble applications out of them. Um, and so I'm trying to look for a way that um, like Nikki's video player, she has some lightweight stuff in this and I, I wouldn't mind seeing the way that she's done that, um, even though I know we have other stuff that she wants to cover. Um, but finding a pattern, um, and this one might do it with this lit translate thing, um, that we could actually ship our elements with support for translation and kind of allow people to pick their translation methodology, but us stick to you know some type of standard. So. Um, there's a nice little demo off of here and it's, it's shown in a GIF here um, that you switch the language and it basically runs through the array and reapplies everything. Um, so what you end up having is like an English.json and then, you know, a ES.json, every, you know, any, any other language you're going to support.json. But um, I'm, I'm not sure that's going to work for what our use case is. So I want you know, the video player to surface, I don't know if that's a hook or an event that it's listening for, um, and basically surface, hey, uh, here's my translations. And then every other element in the DOM, as it's setting up, be able to surface that, hey, here are my translations, so that that en.json um, or, you know, or, or uh, Spanish version.json is gonna be generated on the fly based on what's there out at real time. I don't know how viable that actually is. Um, the paradigm the paradigm I'm thinking to go off of um, that I'd love some pushback on or like, hey, have you considered is the way that our elements integrate with Hacks. So Hacks is not aware of uh, the video player. The video player informs Hacks that exists and it does that through a static, whoops, static get hacks properties. And so um, our elements have this standard schema definition and then the hacks editor basically as it's loading, reads through your elements and goes, hey, do you implement this, this callback? If you do, then I know we can, we can have a conversation. So um, I was thinking 
that I might go about trying to do translations that way, that the elements themselves would be able to surface a standard and then something else would be the thing that actually came in and said like, oh, hey, you know, now we're going to switch the language over to, to X. Um, anybody think that's a good idea? Have other ideas? I have literally, you know, know of other libraries for doing this. I really have no experience in doing internationalization outside of Drupal, which attempts to do some of this modularity of, of uh, translation files. Yeah, there's a lot of, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. No, 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 go ahead. I was just going to say, um, we, we do this a lot on .com, um, and there's a couple of, I like your approach. I think there's a couple of things to consider. Um, uh, for example, like a lot of large companies are not able to translate immediately. So like you need to be able to have old content on a translated page and new content on an English page, for example, until you can update the old page. Um, I know we do that a lot of times. That's why we basically are hosting, I think we do eight languages, including English, and we host all of them as individual pages they're kind of separate pages because um the designs tend to be like this is the old design and this is the new design in english until we can get the translations back and then update the old pages um, so there need to be some way to indicate at least on the translation set in your json what web component it's using and any settings or config that that needs so that you could have slightly different layout slightly different look and feel on um a different language page. Um, secondary to the like, just the fact that it's slow to get translations from a large company perspective, uh, that's also really valuable because some concepts don't translate well, especially in technology. And so I know we have sometimes different content or diff slightly different layouts for some languages like Chinese, for example, or Japanese as a, as a means of like, better communicating with our audience there. Um, for example, like a Japanese audience is much more um, receptive to animations and um, graphics and things like that than a more serious like English audience might be. Um, and so like we, we keep things like that in mind. And so sometimes the designs are intentionally different. And so you need to be able to connect the pages, but also have slightly different uh, designs if you need to. No, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I hadn't considered the uh, even well, like left to right versus right to left languages, that would have a, a dramatic implication for that. Um, my immediate target was like, okay, if we have um, like a self check that gets thrown into hacks, if we can translate the hacks interfaces UI elements into your native language, so that even the tool tips and things are, are more logical, that'd be cool. But then if you dump in a self check, and it's written in English, it's it's still written in English. Woohoo. So like trying to, uh, trying to solve that immediately, mm -hmm. but yeah, that makes a lot, that makes a lot of sense. Andrew, were you going to say something? I was just going to say that I, I think that, uh, the core being that, uh, I think that you, you'll need like a, a translate module, um, that is handling translation. Um, and like you were talking about, I, I and I could be completely wrong as far as, uh, the the way that you were talking about is informing. Uh, so if the translate module exists, then it's able to pass the information back through, through for the for the different components. Um, I I don't think that it's a good idea to have translation built into the, each one of the individual components. You know what I mean? So you would you would think expected it would be kind of a more global thing that's throttling it. So I, yeah. had I had a thought. Go ahead, Nikki. And it might be kind of similar to the patterns we're using for hacks, is uh, because I'm coming at it from um, the perspective of microcopy management. Oh, Nikki faded away. Nikki, you might want to turn off your video. Mm -hmm. Alt Altoona is destroying your connectiv connectivity again. Okay, streaming. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I am interested in the microcopy side of things and managing that and keeping it consistent throughout our user experience. And I'm wondering if we couldn't use a hacks type pattern where the elements themselves could broadcast what their microcopy is. 
and then somehow then you could create some kind of a module that would take all of that and and gather it up so that it could be translated somewhere centrally. And by module, we're talking, so Andrew, in, in front end land, I would probably call a module like a singleton or like an element that basically is sitting there in the DOM and state it's in manager. charge of, yeah, like a state manager specific for language. Is that what we're talking about, Nikki? Yeah, yeah, like a language. To, and I, I had played around with the idea a while back at because uh, I was looking at like glossary terms and stuff. But I really was looking at how you could do microcopy and contextual help and auto documentation if you had just some kind of manager that kept track of, of what your components have in them and what the text is that they say, if that makes sense. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's going to be... This is going to be something that we'll, we'll have to, I mean, I know we're going to have to come up with a solution for, um, but I might have to actually work with you directly, Nikki, and get your ideas on this. Yeah. <laughs> it can, yeah, honestly, it kind of reminds me of the T function within Drupal. Yeah, and that's that, so that, um, let me post it in the chat, the little, that lit element um, thing, or lit translate, rather. If I can find the link, what the heck? Um, that is effectively the way that the integration ends up working in Lit Translate, it appears, is that you implement it in context, um, basically with like a T or use get is what they have as its equivalent. And then you can kind of pass, pass your variables into the thing in question and it'll skim through that object and be like, oh, you, you mean to have here like function name dot cat dot, first name or whatever. And then if cat's name gets translated into a different language, then you're gonna get that translation served. 